finishing our six week farm system previews, we have the Oakland A's who have traded just about everything not nailed down and received a ton of arms in return. Let's talk about it. You are locked on MLB prospects, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer and podcaster, and thank you for making this your first listen every single day. As always, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started today. So, the Oakland A's have, to put it charitably, been tearing it down, right? Traded a lot of prospects, or I'm sorry, traded a lot of big league players for prospects. Matt Olson, Sean Murphy, uh, Frankie Montes, a lot of guys, and have received a ton of arms in those deals. Uh, interestingly, I actually have the top two prospects in this system as guys that they drafted that are not arms. Uh, started off with Tyler Soderstrom. Trying to figure out, he's been listed as a catcher, and I think now we're at the point where you probably should list him as a first baseman slash catcher, because last year for the first time he played more games at first than behind the plate. But 2020 first rounder out of high school, 6'2", 205, and got in 134 games last year between high A, double A, and a brief week and a half at the very end with the Las Vegas Aviators. Uh, 267, 324, 501, 29 home runs, 55 extra base hits, 40 walks to 145 strikeouts, and 0 for 1 on stolen bases. So here's the thing about Tyler Soderstrom. The offense is pretty good. I mean, you 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 heard the numbers. Uh, he he did better, small sample size, but like the batting average was up at almost 300 in AAA. Again, very small sample size. But his batting average got better at every level, going from Lansing to Midland to Las Vegas. The on-base hovered around the same. The slugging from Lansing to Midland was around the same, within about 10 to 20, like 10 to 15 points of each other. So, the thing here, plus hit tool, left-handed swing, and it is a very smooth, very graceful swing, looks very pretty swing. Uh, He can get power to all fields. He has plus raw power. I think it's going to be plus game power as well. Uh, He's continued to get stronger. Like I said, now 6'2", 205. And uh, very good as far as pitch recognition, feel for the barrel, uh, plate coverage, things like that. If you throw him a... like It's hard to beat him by uh, fooling him or blowing a strike past him. Now, he is some he is aggressive at the plate and as he moved up a bit, you could see pitchers get him to chase uh, and maybe try to make contact with suboptimal pitches. So, definitely something for Tyler Soderstrom to work on is is uh, pulling back just enough on the aggressiveness where you can't use it against him. Now, the issue here is his offense is significantly ahead of his defense. And so I mean, it's something where in 2023, offensively, you could see a case to have him up in the bigs at some point in time during the season. Defensively, it's not. So he came up as a catcher. He's been working at catcher. Last year, he got 59 games at first base, 52 behind the plate, and 25 as a DH. He did get better. Uh, It's something where like, he's athletic enough to handle the position. His speed's below average, but... He's got good athleticism, so you know he, he's gotten better at moving side to side, the lateral agility to block balls, things like that. But his ceiling is probably still below average to fringe as a catcher. And in this system, you have I, I feel like you have enough catchers, you have enough talented defenders and things like that. You know, you have... Shane McGuire is a very talented defensive catcher. Obviously, you have Shea Ling Lears, who graduated last year, who is a plus defender at the big league level, where obviously you can move Soderstrom to first base or something like that. I think he's athletic enough to maybe try third base or something like a left or right field. The arm is above average. Again, the defense, I'm sorry, the, the speed 
is below average. But again, athletic enough where you could try Tyler Soderstrom at some of these other positions. It doesn't necessarily have to be first base. I do think that is the fastest path to get him to the bigs. And he looked to get more comfortable uh, at first base as the season progressed and he did more there. I think at the big league level, what's going to end up happening is you have Shea Langoliers as the starter. Right now, you have veteran Manny Pena, who was part of that Sean Murphy trade. Uh, you have him as your backup. And then Soderstrom, don't get rid of the glove, don't get rid of the pads. Keep all of that it's like a break glass in case of emergency scenario to have like an emergency third catcher. But Soderstrom could be up in 2023 if you commit to him as a position player versus a catcher. Either way, feel like he's going to be one of those middle of the order guys. He'll start off at AAA Las Vegas with the Aviators this year uh, and look and just look to see what he does from there. Number two prospect in the system, for me at least, is infielder Zach Gelliff. 2021 second rounder out of the University of Virginia. Another guy actually drafted by this organization, not part of a trade. Uh, got in 96 games last year between double A and AAA. 270, 352, 463, 18 home runs, 37 extra base hits, 50 walks to 121 strikeouts, and 10 to 12 on stolen bases. Offensively, very, very smooth and simple swing. Uh, I think that the, the contact tool is probably going to be about average. And the issues you have here is still prone to chase a bit, which, I mean, he's 22 years old, but he's he's been in the system now for two full years. You're looking for him to get a little bit better with that. And then he is particularly aggressive with the first pitch. He likes to swing at the very first pitch of the at-bat. And you can see pitchers start to understand that and use that against him while they are while they're developing game plans and they're trying to get him out, get him in a hole early, and then he's forced to chase some more, and he's forced to expand the zone to try to make something out of the at-bat. So something he's going to have to work on. Power-wise, it's probably above average. I'd say the raw power is plus, but I think he's going to top out at above average as far as game power. It's a pretty flat swing, and I've noticed he'll pull home runs. And then you'll get some some like opposite field line drives and things like that. It's not quite power to all fields. Again, the home runs are still something where he, you know, he he pulls that as a righty. He's hitting that to left field, but he can hit a line drive the other way. So not the biggest concern in the world about how the power plays. Defensively, the arm is average, but it's inconsistent. The throws are kind of what give him trouble. He's been at shortstop. Uh, you know, coming up at Virginia, things like that. They they started to move him some to second base last year. Uh, there's been discussion about, do we want to try him in the outfield as well? I think that, again, the arm being average, second base is a better bet than third base. Uh, does kind of mitigate some of the some of the throwing issues. And again, and he did try a game in center field last year. I want to say it was with double-A Midland. But, You have so many center field options in this system. Denzel Clark's a guy we'll talk about in the third segment. You also, I mean, you've you've traded for guys recently. You have Christian Pache. So there's plenty of options in center where you don't necessarily need him there, but I could see him working in a left field or a right field scenario. All right, let's start getting to the pitchers. Uh, Number three prospect in this system. A couple places have him number two. I think Baseball America has him number two. Pipeline probably is going to have him number two when they come out. Uh, Kyle Muller, left-hand pitcher, 2016 second rounder by the Braves out of high school, part of the Sean Murphy deal. Big boy, 6'7", 250. Got in 23 games in AAA last year with the Braves. 3 ERA in 134 two-thirds innings. 159 strikeouts, so 10.6 per nine, to 40 walks, 2.7 per nine, and 14 home runs allowed. He did get in three games at the big league level, a grand total of 12 innings. Uh, 12 Strikeouts to eight walks. But what Kyle Muller does well, plus fastball, sits in the low to mid 90s, can touch 98 with it, doesn't have great uh, movement to it, but because of the extension, it feels like it's faster than it actually is. That perceived velocity is higher. Uh, The Braves tried to get him to throw it a lot more, especially early in the count. 
uh, and to try to get swings and misses with it. And so last year, he threw over 70% of his fastballs for strikes. That's a great stat. Thanks. Shout out to Baseball America for that. Uh, he has a, a a slider, plus slider sits in the upper 80s. Kind of hard as far as like the movement. It's firm, but also hard as in velocity. It's one of the faster lefty sliders in all of the minors um, or the majors for that matter. Just, just You don't see a lot of high 80 sliders from lefties. Uh, has a curveball, two-plane break, sits in the, the, the low 80s. It's probably average to above average. And then he has a below average changeup, sits in the upper 80s. And really is just something he uses against righties. He doesn't have a lot of movement on it. The velocity, I always talk about on the show, we'd like to see around 10 miles an hour, better difference between the fastball and the changeup. This sitting upper 80s when the fastball sits mid 90s, topping out in the upper 90s means it just doesn't quite have that separation there. So some work to do. Uh, for Kyle Muller, he's barely a prospect. Four more, I, like an inning and a third, and he's no longer a prospect. Four more ounces is what he needs. Uh, but he should break camp as a starter, probably going to be in the back half of the rotation, and gives you a high floor as far as a guy who can just eat tons of innings, who can uh, turn over a lineup, you know, gonna, still going to strike out somewhere between eight and nine guys per nine innings. Uh, number four prospect in this system you know, around around the same age, but a draft pick by this organization is Mason Miller, the righty. 2021 third rounder out of Gardner-Webb. 6'5", 220, another physical specimen. A lot of these guys are, a lot of these pitchers are over 200 pounds. You know, it's just something where they have guys who are physically developed, whether they were here or developed somewhere else in a different system. Got in six games between high A and, and triple A. So he had a, a, a shoulder strain in 2022. And so uh, didn't get to pitch much of any until late in the year. Got like 16 innings in, mostly in high A, but they bumped him to triple A at the very end with that, that September call that we kept talking about. And then went to the Arizona Fall League where he performed really well. But those six games during the season 14 innings, 3.86 ERA, 25 strikeouts, 16.1 per nine to three walks, 1.9 per nine, three home runs. When he went to the Arizona Fall League, another six games, 16 and two-thirds innings this time, 3-2-4 ERA, 20 strikeouts, so 10.8 per nine, to four walks, 2.2 per nine, and one home run. What he does, he throws um, at least one 70-grade pitch, if not two. There's some, there's some uh, debate on the second one. So the, the, the four-seam fastball, is a consensus 70-grade pitch. Sits in the high 90s. He can touch 102 with it. Does really well up in the zone. Has that carry up in the zone. And then gets some run to the arm side. Could be a little bit more, but at 102, it doesn't necessarily matter how much it moves side to side. It's going to be hard for a lot of guys to just uh, to, to square up with it. He's got a sweepy slider in the mid-80s. A lot of places have it as a 60. I have it a little bit higher, so closer to a 70-grade Gets a ton of swing and miss on it. He can throw it uh, both sides of the plate. He can throw it for a strike both ways. He can kind of put it wherever he wants to put it. Uh, he has a cutter as well. Um, he's bringing that back this year. He It was something where as he was recovering from, from the injury last year, the A's asked him not to throw it. So he's bringing that back this year. But when he has thrown it, it's been a plus pitch. Curious to see what the cutter looks like this year. And then he has a changeup, which is probably average. It's in the low 90s, kind of firm, uh, still needs some work to it. Not necessarily a super reliable thing yet. Um, again, the, the body, really good, 6'5", 220. He has to stay healthy. Obviously, he has to show that he still has control of these weapons after uh, missing time last year and then seeing what the cutter can do. Uh, it feels like he could be a number four, maybe a number three, if he can command all four of these pitches who are that are all average or better, I think and then just be healthy. But that's a big question there. In just a minute, you've traded for a ton of pitchers. Let's talk about some of the more promising ones. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here. Now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, the America's number one sports book. New customers get a no-sweat first bet, up to $1,000 in bonus bets. Back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Safe, secure, super easy to use. 
You can bet on everything from the money line, point scores, threes drained, all that kind of stuff. And then combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets back when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. Okay, so state of the pitching, one of the big features in a lot of these trades has been we want arms back. So the Sean Murphy deal, uh, the Frankie Montes deal, the Matt Olson deal, just all of these trades where you're sending you know, the Trevino deal, where you're sending guys out, they're getting pitching, starting pitching prospects back. So Ken Waldachuk came from the Yankees in the Frankie Montes deal, which I believe Montes is going to be out most of the year with shoulder surgery, and then he's going to be a free agent after that. So like, man, that deal probably just didn't work out that well for the Yankees. But 2019 fifth rounder out of St. Mary's, Ken Waldachuk, 6'4", 220, got in 21 games last year between AA Somerset in the Yankees organization, AAA Scranton Wilkes Bar in the Yankees organization, and AAA Las Vegas with the A's. Combined slash line in all of those, 284 ERA in 95 innings pitched, 137 strikeouts of 13.9, 36 walks, 3.4 per nine, and 10 home runs allowed. There is there is some discrepancy in the projections for Ken Waldachuk because he's so funky, right? Uh, it's a really kind of unusual delivery, a lot of deception in there. And he doesn't always stay synced, like biomechanically, upper half to lower half, uh, doesn't always stay together in there. But the actual stuff that he throws, I like the pitches. So the fastball is an above average fastball, sits in the mid 90s. It's a four seamer, does really well up in the zone. Uh, You have a plus slider. It's that characteristic Yankee slider that tons of sweep, probably one of the better sliders in this system. Uh, and he likes to throw it on a righty to throw it at the back foot. Just makes it, it's it's one of those where you may swing in a pitch that ends up hitting you in the foot. It's just ridiculous to watch. Tons of fun. He has a changeup. It's probably above average or so. It sits in the low 80s. Kind of, not exclusively to righties, but most of the time, like, that's the only, he's not throwing a ton to lefties. It's just not a great movement profile against a lefty. And then he has a curveball. I've got it as a below average pitch. It's in the mid 70s. He'll throw it early to try to steal a strike, but it's not a big, it's not an out pitch, and it's not a big part of what he does. So uh, I like the combination of stuff. I like that he can throw strikes, and I like that he his stuff, like that he has swing and miss stuff. It feels like a lot of lefties, especially ones who their best pitch is is a slider, a breaking pitch. A lot of them, it feels like they're kind of banking on soft contact, ground balls, things like that. I like that he can blow it past you. You've got work on the delivery. Obviously, you have to figure that out. If everything hits, you're looking at like a number three or so, somewhere middle of the rotation. Uh, He's he's, he's at spring training. Uh, He's going to be a candidate for one of the starting spots. I've got him winning a starting spot. I like Ken Waldachuk a lot. Again, just funky, deception-filled delivery. It's just a question of, How consistent can he get with it? And then if he does that, does the control get a little bit better to go along with that? Uh, Another arm in this system that's really interesting, right-hand pitcher Roiber Salinas, 2018 IFA, 6'3", 235, came from the Braves in the Sean Murphy deal. Uh, 25 games last year between A-ball and high A with the Braves. So low A Augusta, the Augusta Green Jackets, and then with high A Rome. 355 ERA and 109 innings pitched, 175 strikeouts, so 14.4, 63 walks, 5.2 walks per nine, seven home runs allowed. So you can hear a little bit of control issues there looking at the walks. The walks ticked up when he got to high A. He went from four and a half per nine in low A to 5.4 in high A Rome, and he spent most of the year at high A Rome. But the actual arsenal that he has, fastball, Somewhere between a 60 and a 70, I've seen both. I have it uh, because of some of the issues he it feels like he has with commanding some of this stuff. I think is why a lot of people mark it down as a 60. I've got the fastball as a 70. 
It sits about 95. I think it's max last year. Uh, I've uh, Somebody said 98. I saw 97. But either way, it does pretty well. A lot of ride up in the zone. Does really well when he elevates it. Uh, to go along with that, multiple breaking balls. Has a curveball. Sits low 80s. One of those hammer breaking curveballs. So absolutely love to see just how dramatic that curveball is. And then a slider, it's that Braves gyro slider. Sits in the high 80s. He touched 90 with it last year. And the Braves, th- these are all changes the Braves made. He started off, he had a, um, he had like a slower, kind of like a loopier curveball. And they changed him to the gyro slider, the Spencer Strider gyro slider. And then to that that harder breaking curveball. Both of them, it feels like, miss bats pretty well. He throws the slider for a strike more, but I feel like the curveball works better with the fastball. But either way, you have to work on the control. If you don't, you're looking at a hot, like a back of the bullpen kind of guy, somebody who's your setup man or potentially a closer. But either way, I really like the the, the tools here, and it's something where he's probably going to start off at double A in this Oakland system to see how he can improve. Uh, the third pitcher I want to make sure that we mention, there's so many. I mean, Ryan Cusick, Gunnar Hawkland, JT Ginn, Joey Esses. There's so many arms that they've gotten in trade recently. But I want to look at Freddie Tarnock. 2017 third rounder out of high school, again, by the Braves. Came over in the Sean Murphy deal. Got 25 games last year. 20 of three of those were starts between A Mississippi, the Mississippi Braves, and then AAA Gwinnett, the Gwinnett Stripers, and then one game in relief in the bigs, literally two-thirds of an inning with one strikeout. So not even worth going over the big league stats. The minor league stats, 405 ERA and 106 and two-thirds innings, 124 strikeouts, so 10.5 per nine, 44 walks, 3.7 per nine, 15 home runs allowed. The stuff that Freddie Tarnock does is the when the fastball's on, it's a plus pitch. Sits mid-90s or so, 94, 95, can run it up to 98 or 99. Uh, decent spin numbers to it, and then, again, does really well up in the zone, kind of has that extra carry, right? Uh, his main out pitch as far as breaking pitches is a curveball, 12 to 6 breaking curveball, so I like it against both lefties and righties. Sits in the upper 70s. It wasn't as good last year as it was in 2021. So I'm not quite sure what happened there. He was working on a slider last year, below average, in the low 80s. He was working on a changeup, below average, in the mid 80s. So I don't know if maybe it was something to focus on those other pitches and the different, like the way that they feel differently from what you're doing, mess with him a little bit and or you know, made this stuff play weird. I'm, I'm not sure what happened, why uh, why the curveball backed up. It's still, it's still above average, you know, s- still a good pitch, but it used to be a fantastic pitch. So kind of curious about that. Um, if he can rediscover the form of the curveball and then get one of those secondaries to at least get to average, you're looking at him as a back end of the rotation kind of guy. Uh, they did use an option on him last year. He only has two left. Uh, probably will go to AAA Las Vegas this year to start the season. Because again, you have a lot of pitching prospects who are competing for spots in the rotation. Again, Ryan Cusick, uh, JT Ginn, Joey Estes, all those guys. And so the the, the goal here is fix the secondaries, and, or develop the secondaries, and then keep the biomechanics of the delivery in line. Again, he does some of that upper half, lower half separation kind of stuff. And if he can just get the delivery synchronized uh, top to bottom, he where he can, you know, he's not, he doesn't have extra wasted movement out to the sides and things like that, but he's biomechanically pure. You're looking at, I think he could be a back of the rotation guy, but if not, he's going to be a reliever. And just a minute, let's look at the superlatives for this system. Your power tool is only as good as your hit tool, the best outfield defender, your breakout player, and all of that right here. Unlocked on MLB Prospects. And we are back. So, your power tool is only as good as your hit tool. A lot of places have the best power hitter in this system as Tyler Soderstrom. I actually like Lawrence Butler. 
So, uh, outfielder and first baseman, 2018 sixth rounder out of high school. Uh, they got him. He's from the Atlanta area, so it kind of makes sense. They have all these Atlanta players, Atlanta prospects now, and they have this guy from the Atlanta area. 6'4", 185. Got an 81 games last year in high A, uh, and then went to the Arizona Fall League. 270, 357, 468 during the season. So this is at high A, the 81 games in high A. Um, he did have a couple games in rookie ball as he was rehabbing from something like a arm injury, but uh, this is just on a, just an A ball. 270, 357, 468, 11 home runs, 33 extra base hits, 40 walks to 105 strikeouts, and 13 to 18 on stolen bases. Started off as a first baseman, and they moved him to the outfield uh, last year, putting him in right. The arm's only average, but the speed is plus. He's a pretty good athlete for being 6'4". And so uh, he's played, he played some of everything in Arizona Fall League. I think the speed helps in the outfield. He's just a little raw when it comes to uh, the the reads, the reouts, the reactions. The route is really what, to me, is kind of suboptimal right now. He needs to get better at that, and that's an experience thing. I'm not too worried about it. He's gotten pretty good. He's a good athlete, and I'm, I've, I've, I've seen him improve over the course of last season, the times I was able to catch games uh, from the Lansing Lugnuts. Uh, offensively, Power plus power. He has uh, just fantastic raw power. It's probably the same level as Tyler Soderstrom. Uh, the issue and the reason I have him here is because he strikes out too much. Lansing, with the lug nuts last year, 31% strikeout rate. Uh, he's worked on the swing, the actual mechanics of the swing. He had a really, like an uppercut kind of swing. And if you think about the profile of an uppercut swing, it's not spending as much time in the in the strike zone as a swing that doesn't have such an extreme angle. So he's worked to kind of uh, shorten the swing, lower the angle a bit to spend more time in the zone. And then he's tried to work on his actual pitch recognition. So picking up off speed out of the hand, picking up something breaking out of the hand, and being able to understand this is going to be a strike, this is not going to be a strike, what can I do with this? Uh, I don't necessarily think he's all the way there yet. He is, he seems kind of disciplined, you know, where where he's not going to chase at a ton of stuff, but it's almost to a fault, right? There'll be times when it's a hittable pitch, but he's waiting for like the perfect pitch. And sometimes perfect is the enemy of good. So I want to see a little bit better uh, work on pitch selection. You know, there's a difference in being being patient and being passive. And I feel like sometimes Lawrence Butler gets into the passive. He got better about it last year, but I still feel like that's an issue sometimes. And because of the longer levers and things like that, he's always going to have swing and miss in the zone. Just going to be part of his game. Again, 31% in Lansing. That's not going. That usually doesn't get markedly better when you move up in the system. But he has he has plenty of power, and I think if he can pick up the outfield, okay, you know work on those reads, those routes, those reactions, and then be able to get the power in games better. So have better contact ability um, and not losing the patience. He walked like 12% of the time last year. I think it's a pretty high ceiling for Lawrence Butler. You just have some work. Not quite there yet, but I like him. Uh, if he was available in my dynasty league, I'd pick him up. Uh, that's That's how I feel about Lawrence Butler. I like him. He's just not quite there yet. Uh, your breakout prospect in this system, to me, third baseman Brett Harris, 2021 seventh rounder out of Gonzaga, 6'3", 208, and he got 113 games between high A and double A last year. So high A, Lansing, double A, Midland. Most of those in double A, Midland. 290, 375, 475. 17 home runs, 41 extra base hits, 50 walks to 83 strikeouts, and 11 to 16 on stolen bases. Uh, defensively, I really like, he's a very good defender at third base. He was, uh, the year that he was, like in 2021 when he was drafted, he was defensive player of the year in his conference. And so, very good defense at third. And I think the athleticism is good enough where he could play at second, he could play at short as well. So it's a possible utility profile if the bat comes around. I think the bat could come around. It's a very simple swing. Uh, so, you know, simple swing, 
um, good pitch recognition, and he can use, he can make impact to the ball to all fields. The big question for Brett Harris is what is the ceiling as far as his power? Uh, He was predicted to have below average power as a draft prospect. Again, he hit, he had a slugging of 578 in high A Lansing and of 441 in double A Midland. So, do I think he's going to be in the bigs at a 578? No. Do I think that 440 or better is possible at the big league level? I do. And so, the, how far his power goes will determine his ultimate ceiling. But I think that the the tools that he has and then the type of hitters that Oakland is good at developing and making better. I mean, you'll all these guys that they traded away, Matt Olson, Sean Murphy, all like... Matt Chapman, all those guys, those were, for the most part, homegrown guys. They developed those hitters. They can like they have a bad reputation as being a bad baseball team now, but the player development is good, and they can get a lot out of prospects. And so I feel good about the ability for the athletics to take what Brett Harris does and make him into a viable big leaguer. I, I like it. I feel good about it. I feel better about it than I would any other typical 7th round draft pick. Uh, Your best outfield defender in this system, and one of your highest ceiling and possibly lowest floor guys, is outfielder Denzel Clark. 2021 4th rounder out of Cal State. 6'5", 220. Got in 93 games last year between uh, A and high A. So Stockton and Lansing. 248, 365, 469. 15 home runs, 42 extra base hits. 56 walks to 135 strikeouts, again, in 93 games, and 30 of 33 on stolen bases. Uh, Best outfield defender in the system. He has plus speed, really good as far as the reads, the routes, the reactions. His arm isn't great. His arm is below average. And so I don't know if he'll stick in center simply because the arm is less than ideal. Uh, Usually it just, it works out better to be in left field if your arm is not great. And given this huge outfield in Oakland, you know, you really could play three center fielders and have above average defense because these uh, this outfield is so massive. Offensively, he has uh, plus raw power. And like, even if he doesn't make quality contact, there's a chance this ball could go. Like it's, the power is there. But uh, his... Like, even though he's done some work to simplify his swing, and Baseball America had a nice thing about, like, back in college, he completely rebuilt his entire swing. But it's he still struggles not only with with, uh, with swing and miss in the zone, but he, again, same thing I've mentioned with a couple guys, struggles uh, sinking the lower half to the upper half. So something where where he needs more consistency with the mechanics, staying in his form, in the swing, uh, so something to work on. He does get aggressive at the plate sometimes, so another kind of thing you have to be mindful of. But I like the the package of tools here for Denzel Clark, and this is going to be the real uh, the real test for this to player development system is can they get Denzel Clark to the 80th percentile outcome with his tools? That'll be the most interesting kind of thing for me to watch this season. I expect him, he may go back to high A, but I'd like to see him in double A this year just to try to give him that push and see what he can do. All depends on how they feel about him at spring training. It's a fantastic week this week. This is the uh, the end of our six weeks of farm system previews. We're back to our standard five days a week next week. We have a great interview coming up with Evan Drellich, author of the book about the Houston Astros uh, trash can sign stealing scandal, as well as plenty of other stuff. Our breakout prospects, uh, as always, mailbag is on Monday. If you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. You can email us Locked On MLB Prospects at gmail.com or drop your questions in the Locked On MLB Prospects Discord. Link is in the episode description, and the link is in the show notes. Enjoy your weekend, and until Monday, this has been Locked On MLB Prospects. Oh.